this question. M Mr. Chairman, I'm surprised at Minister Darnell. First of all, Mr. Minister, you made a bag of it in the beginning by changing the judges. You made a complete bag of it at that time because I went to the Lafay Commission and you had seven barristers there questioning me and telling me I was telling lies when I told them that I got raped on a Saturday, got a merciful beating after it, and then stopped, he came along the following morning and put all the communion in my mouth. You don't know what happened there. You haven't the foggies, you're talking through your hat there, and you're talking to a Fianna Fáil man, a former councillor, a former mayor. You're talking to, that what tooth and nail for, you, for the party that you're talking about now. You didn't do it right. You got it wrong. Admit it. And apologise for doing that. Because you don't know what I feel inside me. You don't know the heart I am. And ask your leader, would you stop making a political football of this? You hurt us when you do that. You tear the shreds from inside our body. For God's sake, try and give us some peace. Try and give us some peace and, and, and not to continue hurting us. He said, you're in it for the money. We didn't want money. We didn't want money. We wanted the, someone to stand up and say, yes, these fellas were buggered. These people were robbed. Little girls, my daughter, or sorry, my sister, a month old when she was put into an institution. Eight of us from the one family, dragged by the, the ISPCC cruelty man, put into two cars, brought to the court in Clanmel, left standing there w w without food or anything. And the fellow in the long black frock and the white collar came along and he put us into a scut truck and landed us below with 200 other boys. Two nights later, I was raped. About anything you want to tell us about? They, okay. Who is the most hurt? What did they do to children? They hurt them, and they do sex to them, and they pay sweeties for them. And they, what did we, they do to you? And they pay sweeties, like for bump, sex. Yeah, for sex, and then bump a bag of sweets. And we have Mentos, we have Snickers, we have Mars, we have the church, the big church in Hampstead. Uh, they do sets then they go all and that's why they go all together and they do sets. They talk to each other and they tell me they're my best um, my dad tells me they will be a fifth sweet it means best friends forever. Okay, so your dad told you mm. him and the year four teacher yes. of the FFs. Yeah. Okay. And when did he tell you that? He told uh, when he was doing the sex to me, he does sex to me. What does that mean, sex? What do you mean? He touches me in a private, um, he, he, um, he touches me in a private, um, he sticks a plastic willy yeah. in my bottom and it bleeds down. Okay, so, yes. so your dad does sex to you yeah. and what that means is he touches your private yes. and put a plastic willy in, my bottom. in your bottom. Yeah, a big fat one. Okay, so how do you know it's a plastic willy? Um, I, f I felt it before. What do you mean you felt it before? I felt the willy. He told me, he showed me, um, he, he let me felt the willy. Okay, so tell me what that looks like, this willy. Mm. My dad is the boss of every single thing. Right, okay, if we just talk about this, this yeah. black coloured, this black skin coloured willy. Yeah. So, he's shown, it's, he's, he's shown me a shape, how big it was. Yeah. And then you say, and then so how long is it? So that's, you show me that really shape. long, like that long. So it's that long. Yeah. And you show me how wide it is. And then what does he do with it? And he sticks it on my bottom and it, and then after when he takes it out, it bleeds. So how does he stick it in your bottom? He um, pushes it inside my bottom. Okay. Yeah, and then Okay. So when, did, when was the last time this happened? No, um, uh, um, I'll tell you why he started doing it when I was a baby. Okay, but when was the last time it happened? The last time it ha ever happened, yeah. yeah, England. Okay, so, um, she was there, Mr Hollings was there, you said your dad was there? Yes, the head teacher does it, sticks a wheelie in my bottom. Um, the head teacher's name is Mrs For Mrs Forster. Forster. Mrs. Forster. Mrs. Forster. 
FOS. No, Mrs. Forstyke. Forstyke. Okay, yeah. Mrs. Forstyke. And her first name is Kate. Kate. Yeah. Okay. And she got a sister, which is the second, the second head teacher. And her name is Mr. Mrs. Unwin. Okay. And, it's, and the sisters, and it's really strange what her her first name is also Kate too. So you're having the party, and yeah. then what's happened at the end of the party? Um, so um, my dad kills babies and he eats the meat. Okay, well let's just talk about yeah. the party day, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, so the party, yeah. what was the party like? I don't like the party. Why not? They touch me, Who? They kick me, my front privates, they hurt me. So um, when they um, when they stick a uh, big plaster really in my bottom, and when it bleeds, if I cry, um, he, um, he, um, he, like do you know those um, um spaghetti spoons? Yes. Like, uh, yeah. Um, those metal ones. If I cry, he hits me on the head with it. Okay. But if I cry more, he hits me again. But if I cry more, um, then my the nurse teacher, Miss Marden, she injects in me, and I. A sleeping injection on my neck, and then I fell asleep straight away. Okay. Um, what I'd like to go about, I just want to talk about just the party yeah. day. So I don't want to hear about anything else yeah. other than that day. Okay. So all the yeah. stuff that's happened on different days, yeah. we'll talk about. We will talk about. We will talk about. I promise, but not. We will talk about. We will talk about. Start with breaking news this afternoon. Police investigating allegations of an establishment paedophile ring that abused children during the 70s and 80s says they're actively looking into the possible murders of three young boys. The claims centre on a series of claims that child sex parties were held at a residential apartment complex in Dolphin Square in Westminster, which was popular with MPs and the security services at the time. Let's take a look at the key developments for you so far this afternoon. Detectives had already said they were investigating a homicide claim, but this lunchtime they went further, stating they were now looking into three possible murders. They're also looking at abuse at military bases in London and the home counties over the same period of time. And the officer leading the inquiry made an appeal for men who might have been abused and other potential witnesses to come forward. Scotland Yard detectives have just been briefing journalists on these latest developments. Tom Parmenta was among them, joins us now. Three possible murders, Tom. They are gravely serious allegations and they are based on one witness called Nick. It's not his real name, but he's come forward to the police in the last couple of months and has given the police what they say as something they believe is a true and credible account of abuse at parties in London as a young boy and also how he had information relating to three potential young boys being killed as part of that abuse. So deeply serious allegations, complex for the police to try to investigate it after so many years, but they say that they will, they will go where the evidence takes them, wherever that may be. So Nick is one person who has given information to the police. Another is someone that we call Michael, who spoke to us first three years ago about being taken from his care homes in North Wales to be trafficked, bussed down to London to be abused by groups of powerful men. This week he has taken us to the area of London where he says he was abused. This is Michael's story. As a young boy from a Welsh care home, the streets of Pimlico seemed like a different world back in the 1980s. Michael only saw these streets because he and other kids were bussed down here at weekends, plied with alcohol and sexually abused by powerful men. In that, in that summer. Could have been covered up. Because MPs were involved, you know. Ministers were involved, cabinet ministers. I know they were. Even though they, towards they were, they, were, they were kind of good days out, because um, we'd be taken to London afterwards, and, you know, kind of spoil. And when we were kids from North Wales, we'd never seen London and Regent's Park Zoo, or Hyde Park, or Big Ben, and all that stuff. 
has to put up with some nonsense that some people did at night time, you know, in a, in a flat. Didn't think it'd be, it'd be a, you know, it'd be a, be a paedophile rank. How old were you, do you think, at the stage, stage where they were bringing you down here? Yeah. 11, 12 years old. It's a five minute walk from these streets to Dolphin Square by the River Thames. The police say they have another credible witness who has said he was abused at parties here. He's also prompted them to start a murder investigation, looking at claims three young boys were killed, although not necessarily at Dolphin Square. The complex has always been popular with politicians because it's a short walk from here to the Palace of Westminster. There are further allegations of abuse in Lambeth, Barnes, Islington and Richmond, but much of it can be linked back to Westminster. The government has started its independent inquiry, but still hasn't found somebody suitable to lead the stage, but they believe the account, they believe Nick, this witness that they have got into their investigation, who they say is credible, and that is why they are leading this murder investigation. Now, exactly where that goes and who it involves is one thing. The wider issue of these abuse parties that were going on where boys from care homes or from elsewhere were abused, that is also part of these police inquiries that are going on. I think where we are now is an unprecedented spot in relation to the government looking back at this, trying to give every commitment they possibly can to the survivors, those who suffered so much throughout this abuse for so many years afterwards, and also from the police today to say they will go where the evidence takes them, wherever that might be. Very good afternoon. Rotherham Council has been condemned as not fit for purpose, failing victims of child sex abuse and failing to tackle their abusers. A disturbing report details a complete failure of leadership, an organisation struggling with sexism, bullying and misplaced political correctness. In the last half hour, the council has announced that its entire cabinet has resigned. Here are some extracts from the report for you. It says the council has ineffective leadership and management. A culture of covering up uncomfortable truths, silencing whistleblowers and paying off staff rather than dealing with difficult issues. Goes on to detail a pervading culture of sexism, bullying and silencing debate. ...that Rotherham Council goes to some length to cover up and to silence whistleblowers. There, on that side, and the staff room is just at the front of us. Okay. So just walk in the staff room and then there's this tea, there's this just just kitchen and then there's a sofa and that's where we okay. do sex. So why do you go in there first of all? Why don't you just go to class? No, we, we go to class sometimes too, yes. Oh, I see. We go to class sometimes. Okay. Yes. So you go to class? Yes. Okay, and then what happens when you and go to class? And then they've they got this, in my classroom, they've got this little door at the back, right at the back yeah. of the classroom. They've got a little door and it's just a little tiny little room. It's all stuffed with sweets, prizes, especially to pay children or sweets to do sex to them. Right. Yeah, so they give sweets as much as they like. Yeah. So they so they give sweets so till they're like full they're 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 done. So they because while they eat the sweets, they do sex to them. So they pay them sweets and and then after they do what they want them to do. Okay. Because they will because I'll do so what children when they tell us not to tell about the, this anything, they look so curious. And they, okay. It looks like they're, they're, they it looks like they're not trust. They don't trust us. Okay. So I just get you right, Mr. Holling's house. Yes. I'll go there. You have to pull yes. outside. Then you go to the door. Yes. Dark door. Yes. You go into a corridor. Yes. It's got yes. a little carpet by the yes. door. Wooden floor, very yes. dark like this door. Yes. 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 On the on the sides of the. Yes, there's there. a living room at the front, there's a kitchen and then there's a... There's, there's a little table, yes. then you go into the living room, yes. it's got a large sofa, yes. which is in an L shape, yes. big Samsung telly yes. on a large black shelf. Yes, yes. He right. said, in the dining room area, yes. it's got a wardrobe. Yes. Then and it's all just stuffed in spare clothes, as he said. All stuffed with spare clothes, but if you part it... Yes. Find a little door. Yes, but you can't, you can't, you can't the really cellar. see it because it's kind of, like, kind of camouflaged. It's camouflaged. No, yes, it looks but a bit But there's a little wooden handle. Yes, yes. You can open that. Yes. But go they've got down. exits. The thing is that they've got exits there. 
because it can run out of the house too. Right, okay. But you go down into this, it takes you into a basement. Yes. And then in there, there's loads of cupboards. Yes, there's cupboards and there's and in there, Yes. Your dad, Pastor Papa, Mr. Hollings, some other members of staff. Yes. And then had sex with you. Yes. Using plastic bags. Yes, and then they touch so, each other. Okay. And, if, and as I said, they sell me and my brother for £50 each to every who? single day. To who? To any people. Any people who like. Like any people who would like do well, who are like the kind of people who will actually do sex to like who can't come to a, to school, who are busy or anything like that. But then they keep me and Gabriel yeah. to do sex to whilst they got their equipment. Yeah. Say so they got plastic quillies, yeah. and then they do it, and then after like maybe for two hours, maybe one hour, du during school hours. Okay, so the. What is sex? Yes. We haven't said what sex is. What is it? So, like sex, so they, they touch each so they touch each other in private. Right. Uh, as I said, they well, I did tell you about this, but they got this big plastic stick. Right. Yes, not not plastic, but wooden. Yeah. Yes, and then they put it between our legs and they hit it right between us, but like like in between our legs. So they hit you with a wooden stick yes. between your legs. Yes. What's that? Is that sex? Is it? No, no, no. But What's that's sex? how they had hurt us. But a real sex is like they get plastic quillies. They put stick it in our bum. That's what kind of sex okay. they do. And what is your bum? So they stick it in a plastic quilly in our bum, where oh, okay. so where the poo comes out. Okay, so they put a plastic yes. quilly in the bum where the poo yes. comes out. Yes. Okay. Yes. And anywhere else? Yes, not from private. Okay. And they say now from private. Yes. About. No, no. So if they, if they like, if because if we if we say it hurts or if we cry or make a sound, they'll give us spoon licks. So they'll get spoon, spoon licks. Yes. So they get spoons and then they hit us, hit us, hit us. When and when I spoke out in the House of Commons in London about this, many of the members of Parliament smirked and jeered behind their hands because they were unwilling to believe that such terrible things could be happening. NSPCC, which is our National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, their inspectors that look after children at risk all over the country were reporting that throughout the United Kingdom they were finding evidence of satanic abuse. And so that really reaffirmed what I'd been telling the House of Commons. Uh, co-working happened in Nottinghamshire and that became a cause which the nation began to take notice of. What I had to do was sacrifice one of my own children. I'm trying. I was about 16 been going out with this girl that was involved in Satanism. She fell pregnant, and the same day that the child was born, I had to kill it. A child, when it is first born, is innocent and pure. It's untouched, it's unspoiled. Nothing bad has ever entered that child. That child's thoughts are pure. So, they sacrificed that to the devil as the child being pure. Because all things pure are feared by Satanists and also by the devil. So if you've got something pure and you destroy it, you take away the purity and there's no longer a threat there. They really do think that if they can take away innocence and give it to Satan, that they're giving them the greatest giving him the greatest gift of all. And so it has all, they do it for all kinds of reasons. The first reason is to, to dirty the child inside and out. And the second reason is to destroy the innocence. Where is the proof? Where are the traces? Where are the bodies? One former witch who revealed to me that she had actually been present while a child was sacrificed said they do it in a different way. Normally, the, the high priest 
uh, has relationships with some of the witches in the coven and they produce a child. And when that child is born, it's never registered as born and therefore no one knows that child even came into the world. And I was told it was some of those children that were sacrificed. I would be telephoned by someone to say, we've got a young woman who thinks she's had a baby but can't quite remember. Is this possible? Is it possible for things to happen to you that you've forgotten and you're beginning to remember? So I would say, it is possible, let's talk about it. And gradually the story would emerge of a young woman in her 20s who may have had anything up to six babies as a young woman between the ages of, um, a young girl, between the ages of 11, 12, up to their early 20s, which were aborted and used for sacrifice in a variety of ways in covens. Well, the same thing happens in ritualistic abuse. Uh, yes, you stood and watched that baby be sacrificed and you didn't do anything about it. You, you actually um, abused the person next door to you. You actually subjected them to all kinds of sexual perversions. You were involved in that particular sexual orgy that took place. You can't have been objected to it. You were part of it. So you can't get out of it because you're as guilty as... Because the barristers representing the children said, if we fill the minds of the jury with all this mumbo-jumbo about Satanism, devil worship and black witchcraft, the members of the jury won't believe a word the child is saying. Indeed, some of them wouldn't wish to believe a word the child was saying, and the case would break down. Some children claim that they have seen um, babies microwaved. In other words, put in a microwave oven, and they have said it then fizzles them, whatever. People have often said to me, you know, how do I know that children aren't lying? How do social workers and doctors and everybody? Well, a very low percentage of children lie about this particular kind of problem, or any kind of child sexual abuse. Sometimes because of their tender years, they don't even have the know-how to put this into words unless they've experienced it. And because you know the fear mechanisms around the child cannot be uh, in any way done in any artificial way that these children are genuinely absolutely terrified if you talk to them uh, and I have talked to witches I have talked to people who have been still in are really subconsciously quite frightened and fearful of what they're doing to their children, but they don't seem to be able to stop it. And uh, I once had an experience where a black witch actually rang me up and said her son was about to attain the age of seven years old and was to be initiated, and could I save her son? Nurses, doctors, lawyers. There was judges that I'd been up in court in front of involved. Please. Can a 44-year-old teacher be groomed by a 16-year-old pupil? This was, the, this was the decision of the judge, uh, Joanna Green. She's the, sentencing. Yeah. Um, when when uh, sentencing, yes, Stuart Kerner gave him a suspended sentence. He's a 44-year-old school teacher because the person who's alleged to have or he was found guilty of having had sex with was 16 years old and she said he had been groomed she, she had, by her. She actually said, um, she, because I read the sentencing yes. remarks, he'd been convicted after a trial because he always denied it. Um, so I am surprised the sentence was suspended in those circumstances, if, if, I, yes. if I may say. Um, and actually when you read what she said, she's, she said, if anything, she groomed you. Um, I, I only put that in so that we see it in the context, but it was, it's, she shouldn't have said that because you're quite, you're quite absolutely right. Uh, it's inconceivable for a 16-year-old to groom um, a 44-year-old married man. He willingly did what he did. Um, now, whether 
in all the circumstances. And this is always a problem that we have, because we've not been the jury, we've not been the judge, we've not heard all the facts, but certainly on what I have read, I have to say, I thought it was the sort of case, there used to be an old criminal barrister, blah, blah. Uh, I was surprised that the sentence was suspended, particularly because he'd had a trial, and therefore he put this uh, young woman through the ordeal of a trial. And when people don't put their hands up and admit what they've done wrong, your sympathy levels quite properly drop. My predecessor, Michael Russell, stood in this chamber and spoke about the moral imperative that compels all of us to face up to and act on the reality of historical abuse of children and the current risks of child abuse. Of course, the case for an inquiry is strong. And I am sure that I do not need to tell members of this chamber that we owe it to survivors to find the truth, to speak that truth wherever it needs to be heard and to listen and learn from what we hear. Human rights group Amnesty International has criticised the British government's decision to exclude the notorious Kinkora Boys Home from its inquiry into widespread child abuse in the UK. Now, it has long been alleged that the systematic abuse of children took place in the Belfast home at the hands of a paedophile ring thought to be linked to the intelligence services, namely MI5. It has also been claimed that MI5 blocked police investigations into the abuse who reportedly used the information of child abuse to blackmail, manipulate and coerce members of the establishment who are committing the abuse. So the question must be asked if MI5 were involved, then to what extent, if any, were other intelligence services also involved? Is it possible, as suggested on various blogs, that the CIA and Mossad used the care home to blackmail abusers with orders being dictated from politicians and high-ranking officials in the United Kingdom, the United States and Israel? Is it possible that establishment paedophiles were or still are being controlled by foreign dignitaries? Let's put speculation to one side and examine the facts. If we start at the beginning and work our way forward in time, we will have a much clearer picture of what actually happened at Kinkora. Now, the sex abuse scandal came to light in the mainstream media in 1980, when the Irish Independent reported that despite allegations of abuse for surfacing in 1977, which named prominent businessmen, no prosecutions had taken place. The only form of justice that the victims of Concora have received in 40 years has been the imprisonment of William McGrath, the former head of the home, and two other members of staff, William Semple and Joseph Main, in 1981 for abusing 11 boys. The late Ian Paisley, leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, was accused of being complicit in a cover-up by failing to report his knowledge of McGrath's abuse to the authorities. During the same period, Private Eye magazine reported that high-ranking members of Whitehall and senior officials of the British military were involved in the sexual abuse of boys in Kinkora. Although key information about the care home has vanished, now I've created this diagram to explain the social circles in which McGrath travelled. As you can see, there are many prominent figures here and perhaps, coincidentally, most have connections to the British intelligence services. Obviously, I'm not suggesting that all the men listed here are paedophiles. The purpose of this is to prove that McGrath was embedded within the British establishment. And as we can clearly see, he was connected to a network that consisted of at least three British prime ministers. Of course, this diagram illustrates just one of the possible avenues that ties McGrath to the establishment. There will, of course, be many more other avenues. But as we see here, he operated in the same circles as the likes of Anthony Blunt and Victor Rothschild, who both worked for MI5. Interestingly, the Truth Seeker website reported that one of their informants is a police detective who claims that Anthony Blunt who allegedly ran a high-level paedophile ring, had managed to block police investigations into the horrendous decades of abuse conducted by Jimmy Savile. But the trail doesn't end there. 
a book called War of the Windsors, has linked Lord Mountbatten, yep, the uncle of Prince Philip, to the Kinkora Boys' Home. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the British government will not include Kinkora in their investigation of child abuse. So, what exactly are they afraid of? Why is Kinkora a no-go area when the horrific abuse that happened there seemingly involved incredibly powerful and influential figures of the British establishment? The decision to exclude Kinkora reeks of denial at best and an attempt to cover up a high-level paedophile network at worst. And I'm not alone with this view. This week, Amnesty International criticised the British government's decision. Patrick Corrigan of Amnesty International said, The announcement from the government to exclude Kokora from the inquiry is disappointing, but frankly unsurprising. Victims will feel betrayed by this decision while the public will believe that the conspiracy of silence which has surrounded Kikora for 40 years continues, despite protestations to the contrary by the Northern Ireland Secretary Theresa Villers, the historic institutional abuse inquiry is simply unable to get at the truth behind the abuse and allegations of security service complicity at Kikora. Only an inquiry with the eyes of Westminster and the UK media and the ability to secure the necessary powers of compulsion is equipped to uncover the secrets long hidden at Kikora. In one fell swoop, the UK government has both not public confidence in its commitment to reveal the truth of child abuse across the whole country and undermine the Northern Ireland Inquiry, which has been given a job for which it is sadly ill-equipped. Now, DUP, UUP, Sinn Féin, SDLP and Alliance politicians have all called for the Belfast case to be part of the Home Office probe chaired by Fiona Wolfe. Now, it should also be noted that Fiona Wolfe reportedly has links to former Home Secretary Leon Britton, who misplaced not one but two dossiers detailing sex abuse allegations involving a notorious high-profile paedophile group. Fiona Wolfe is the second person to head the inquiry after Baroness Elizabeth Butler Sloss stepped down after allegations emerged that her brother, the late Sir Michael Havers, was involved in a government whitewash to protect paedophile Sir Peter Heyman. It should also be noted that Baroness Butler Sloss led the inquest into the death of Princess Diana, so her establishment connections run deep. Now, of course, even today, 40 years on, still no politicians or members of the establishment have been questioned by police over the abuse at Kikora. And again, at the very least, we see yet more roadblocks by the British government to prevent investigations into a high-level paedophile network and more often than not actively covering up child abuse. Take a look at this footage from an interview in 1995 with Tim Fortescue, a senior whip in Sir Edward Heath's government between 1970 and 1973. Anyone with any sense who was in trouble would come to the whips and, and tell them the truth. They'd say, no, this, I'm in a jam, can you help? It might be debt, it, um, a scandal involving small boys, or any kind of scandal which um, the, a member seemed likely to be mixed up in, they'd come and ask if we could help. And if we could, we did. And we would do everything we can because we would store up brownie points. If I mean that sounds a pretty, pretty nasty reason, but it's one of the reasons. Is if we can get a chap out of trouble, then he'll, he'll do as we ask for ever more. As you can see, we have an establishment that not only allowed the systematic abuse of children, but actually used it for their own political gain. But how far into the upper echelons does this network reach and who exactly is protecting them? Well, in July 2014, the courageous Peter McKelvey, a retired child protection team manager, who had spent more than 20 years compiling evidence of alleged child abuse by people in authority, believes that at least 40 British MPs are complicit in an alleged Westminster paedophile ring. 
He also claims that some have links with the royal family, who in 2011 conveniently became exempt from public scrutiny as legal reforms made it impossible for members of the public or investigative journalists to obtain vital information about the affairs of the monarchy. And again, we must continue to ask how high-profile members of a nationwide paedophile network, such as Jimmy Savile, Cyril Smith, Rolf House and others, were allowed to become embedded within the establishment, an establishment who not only turned a blind eye, but actually facilitated the abuse and now continues to cover up the truth. I'm Mick Meany, signing off for RIMF Alternative News. I had the qualifications. It never crossed my mind that my brother would be an impediment. I didn't know that he'd ever been given a dossier by Geoffrey Dickens. That was not something when I was a judge. I followed what my brother was doing as Attorney General. We should explain that he was a, a Attorney General. He's your late brother. He was Attorney General. And it was partly as a result of the timing of that that there were concerns as to whether you could be, be impartial. Well, that seemed to me to be an, an attack on my integrity. As a judge, I would expect to be totally impartial, even with my own family. I saw no difficulty. But we live in a world of perception, Sarah. Nobody looks at the reality. They look at how they feel about things. There was another issue which was reported on, not least by the Times, who quoted um, somebody who you, who had brought, when you had c carried out a review of uh, abuse inquiry uh, allegations within the Church of England, there were two priests uh, who had been ab abusing uh, at least one individual. He also mentioned to you allegations of abuse against a bishop. And he quoted you as saying that you would prefer not to refer to this bishop in the report because you cared about the church from outside, and truly independent, who uh, is chairing. First of all, I do believe that the establishment has in the past looked after itself. I think partly because people did not really recognize the seriousness of child abuse, and they didn't think that it was so important and it was more important to protect members of the establishment. Critical of them. Even if but, it was found that they were people who were very close to you? Yes. I. But as a judge, that is the way I was trained. But I do absolutely understand that the public don't believe it. Can I just, just, just yes, a final sorry, question on that? Question. Can it ever get off the ground, this inquiry? I don't know. I worry that the victims, survivors, for whom I have the most enormous sympathy, and as a judge, I tried a great many child abuse cases. I really have huge sympathy for them. But for them to be deciding who should become the uh, person chairing it creates real... Now the Home Secretary will outline this afternoon how she will proceed with the inquiry into historical child abuse. The two people appointed to chair the inquiry, one after the other, quit after concerns about their personal connections. Fiona Wolfe, the second chair to be appointed, stood down on Friday saying she'd lost the confidence of abuse victims. Well, let's take a look at some of the key moments in the inquiry process so far. In July, the Home Secretary announced two new child abuse inquiries. The first was a major Hillsborough-style independent inquiry into how complaints were treated by public bodies. The head of the NSPCC, Peter Wanless, was also appointed to look at the Home Office's alleged failure to act on abuse claims in the 1980s. The next day, retired Judge Baroness Butler Sloss was appointed as chairwoman of the first inquiry, but there were concerns over her family links, including that her brother, Sir Michael Havers, was Attorney General in the 1980s. Days later, she stepped down, acknowledging that those links would cause difficulties. Then, at the start of September, Fiona Wolfe, the Lord Mayor of London, was named as her replacement. But her links to former Home Secretary Leon Britton were revealed. He is likely to be called to give evidence to the inquiry. And last week it emerged that a letter from Miss Wolfe about those links was rewritten seven times with the help from the Home Office. Victims groups called for her to be replaced. On Friday, she stepped down, saying it was time to get out of the way. It's turned into um, a bit of a pantomime, in fact, and, and it, it, wouldn't be, it would be laughable if it wasn't so incredibly serious, because we're talking about an investigation and inquiry that is supposed to be looking into the rape, torture, and abuse of children. And it's, it's turned into a farce, 
and, and we're not sure what is going on. The Chair has been asking you uh, about dinner parties and the rest. Uh, uh, Sorry, could you, order? could somebody just give a tissue to Lady Wolf, so, uh, to Mrs Wolf? That's all right. Are you all right? Yes, fine. Not, not to worry. I'm afraid the House Commons is equipped with many things, but tissues is not one of them. We'll just let you... Apologies for the disruption. No, don't worry. <laughs> we'll uh, monitor it for you and update you further. Meantime, New Zealand High Court Judge Lowell Goddard has been named as the new chair of the historical child abuse inquiry. The Home Secretary Theresa May said Justice Goddard had been selected from a pool of 150 potential candidates and following consultation with victims' groups. The existing inquiry panel will be dissolved and members will be able to reapply for their position. The other aspect, too, is that speaking with my legal hat on, um, there, there are inherent risks in having um, people with um, actual experience as survivors of abuse themselves, as members of an independent, objective, impartial uh, inquiry. Just reflect on this for a moment. You, you come to this committee and to this new post as one of the most distinguished women judges in the history of New Zealand. You have 18 years of seniority on the High Court bench in New Zealand which you're prepared to give up in order to arrive in a country halfway around the world with no home at the moment for you to live in, um, no appropriate visa and um, no idea what your salary is going to be. Um, but you must be very committed to taking on this task, giving up so much, arriving with such huge challenges. Are you absolutely sure? This is what you want to do for four years. I need to go back to New Zealand to get my life into order in a short space of time and then um, relocate. But I would um, hope the work of the inquiry would be up and running from early April. From early April? Yes. And in the meantime, of course, the old panel is dissolved. Yes. So we shouldn't, just to manage expectations here, Parliament and the public should not expect anything of substance to happen until the 1st of April. No, no, I think the panel must be in place. Um, right. Very, uh, before I... That leave, process will yes, go on. I think that process but, has to go on. The processes will go on, um, you know. But I, in terms I, of your hearings and your, your first day at work, yes. it's likely when you're here established with your visa early, and your very house... Very early April, I would... Eight, early it, April. Yes. Okay. Mm. Whatever happens, could we wish you, Judge... <laughs> But the most prominent paedophile associated with the Savile Ring was a man called Edward Heath, uh, who you may recall was Prime Minister and took us into the EEC. Heath was into little boys and Savile was supplying them. A number of these boys were taken out of the Haute de Garenne home in Jersey. Savile was taking children from a children's home with the support of German assets in Jersey. What was happening was that children's homes in the Channel Islands, particularly out to Gren in Jersey, uh, children were being taken from these homes, boys in the case of Edward Heath, as he was gay, um, and a paedophile, were being taken onto his yacht, the Morning Cloud. Savile was actually going out to, he went down to Jersey, and he was actually taking boys. There was another man involved as well, but Savile himself took boys from the children's home where he was a guest, or welcome, onto the boat. So he was taking boys out onto Morning Cloud. Now, since Heath was well known, and since the boys were talking young men, uh, the boys were murdered and thrown off the boat. That's why the BBC and the Cabinet Office have been so keen to protect Savile. That's why the Cabinet Office in the 1980s were willing to back Savile to the point of giving him a position of authority at Broadmoor, which is an absolute, you know, you don't put a paedophile in charge of Broadmoor. The cabinet secretary at the time, who thankfully is no longer with us, Hunt, was also a paedophile, was in on this, met Savile, uh, he was Catholic, met Savile, as did that very nice man, the late Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Basil Hume. Basil was not a paedophile, but knew Hunt and 
had a shrewd idea. He wasn't stupid. He had a shrewd idea of what had been going on, and I've no doubt was told to keep a lid on it. The hunt was in on it, so the Cabinet Secretary at the time was in on it, was aware of what was going on, was aware he had a Prime Minister who was involved not just in abusing young boys, but was murdering them as well. It's quite possible that there was a crewman on the yacht who did the actual murder. I'm not saying Ebert Heath necessarily bashed the boys on the boko and tossed them overboard. He may have had somebody do that for him, but he was certainly guilty of murder under English law as an accessory or uh, on the joint enterprise basis. Oh, if someone is inclined in that direction and you can supply them with boys, then you've got a hold on them, or girls. There's nothing worse for a politician than being exposed in the murder and sexual abuse of young people. And if you've got a politician who is abusing and killing young girls and boys, but boys or girls, then you've got a hold on them. Thumbs up. Nick, four years ago I asked you what were you going to do about institutional people operating in this country now? Your reply to me, Nick, was, I don't know what you mean by institutional paedophile rings. Do you understand what I was talking about four years ago now, Nick, and stay in my eyes? About taxes, thanks very much. Uh, Let's cross to Norman Smith, because he's with the Deputy Prime Minister. Norman, over to you. I remember. Hi, Matthew. I'm not actually with the Deputy Prime Minister because he's had to abort our uh, interview because we were here for uh, a little photo op which the Lib Dems have organised to flag up their, uh, what they say is their key tax measure, which is raising the lower threshold. However, so Mr Clegg was there and all his Lib Dem people were there, but the whole thing had to be aborted because... Uh, well, a few protesters came along and uh, spoiled the occasion, so Mr Clegg has gone over there. I don't know whether he'll be coming back uh, in the near future, but that was one uh, photo op which uh, seemed to hit the buffers, shall we say. However, I suppose the one thing it does flag up is the tussle within the coalition to lay claim to the raising of the lower income tax threshold, because you talk to Institutional paedophile rings operating in this country me, now. Sorry, I just asked we're going to have to leave you. I we're just asked Nick Clegg a question. Norman. We'll, we'll cut across you there, Norman. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, you can see the problem there that uh, Norman Smith was having. We'll try and uh, return to Norman in the next little while. And also, all the teachers have it, but not all parents. So all the teachers have tattoos yeah. on their privates, you say? Yeah. And what type of tattoos do they have on their private? They these devil ta tattoos. Pardon, what type of tattoos? Devil and monster tattoos. On their private? Yes. They all have them? Yes. All of the teachers in, in Christchurch Primary School yes. have devil tattoos on their yeah. private parts. Yeah. No, also monster ones. Yeah, devil is in the middle, but there's a monster one, and also they have piercings. Okay. Here. Where's the birthmark of Mr. Schultz? Here. Over there, yeah? And anything yeah. else? Anything else there? That she's got there? Anything else you can remember? Yeah, she's got like a little dot here. Vanessa's 
Clark Smock. Clark is a boy in my class and he is my best, best friend. Uh, and what's his, what's his mother's name, Vanessa what? Vanessa Patrick. Okay, thank you. What's it? Vanessa Fitzpatrick. Oh, Fitzpatrick. Okay, carry on. Any mark? Any distinguishing marks about her? Yeah, she has um, um, birth marks on her boobs. On her boobies. Yeah. And she's also is really hairy. Her private is like really hairy. Really okay, hairy. that's a lady you call Shepherd's Bush. Yeah. Okay. Will you tell me more about Vanessa? She's she got hairy legs. She got hairy boobies. She got hairy arms. And um, her hair's really wiggly and long. Okay. And, and she's it, got white skin. And any other distinguishing marks about her? Apart from her being very hairy? Yes. Any other marks on her body? Yes. She has like um, a little looking thing. She's got um, a Veruca here. Veruca. A what? No, a Veruca. Veruca. What's a Veruca? No, a Veruca is what I got here. Okay. And she's got one where? One here. Okay. Between her two bones. Anyone else you'd like to tell us about? Yes. We have distinguishing marks here. Yes, they're really strange marks. And um, Mr. Hollings. What exactly do you do as Minister for State and Crime Prevention uh, in, in, in respect of this matter then? What is your responsibilities if you don't know that, the, that a panel meeting was cancelled, where it was, they were to meet members of the public in Birmingham, which was on a website, you're coming before this committee. You're not aware of any briefing that occurred this morning. Uh, what are you aware of in respect of this inquiry? A secret file containing details about unnatural sexual behaviour at Westminster was not disclosed to a government-backed review into claims of child abuse by high-profile figures. Sky News can exclusively reveal the existence of the document, but the head of the NSPCC, who led last year's investigation, says no one alerted him to it. Sky's Tom Parmenter reports. First, we will do everything we can to allow the full investigation of child abuse and the prosecution of its perpetrators. We're going to leave no stone unturned to find out the truth about what happened. The promises go right to the very heart of Westminster. We now know the department responsible for the smooth running of government is sitting on a potentially significant file. We're looking at Prem 19, but if we do an advanced search... Finding old documents is part of Chris Murphy's job. So there's quite a few big security issues within these files, like Iranian hostage situation, Irish terrorism. Absolutely. And as I, as I say, unfortunately, quite a few of them remain... Uh, closed. But within these vast archives, he found one that made him stop. And there it is, allegations against former public of na unnatural sexual proclivity security aspects. I think I did a double take and then started wondering what the potential implications of the title, which is a little vague, um, could be. It was the year after Margaret Thatcher had swept to power. Where there is error, may we bring truth. It's highly likely she saw the contents, documents prepared for the Prime Minister about the sexual practices of somebody of note. 35 years on, it's still classified on grounds of national security. The file is held by officials based here at the Cabinet Office on Whitehall. They've confirmed to us that it still exists. They've also confirmed to us that it is still too sensitive to release. Some of these issues even get more depressing when you keep digging down the rabbit hole. Take the VIP paedophile ring, for example. Some of the top figures in the British Parliament and even Buckingham Palace have been sexually exploiting young, innocent people for years. This disturbing truth has been happening for decades. Good old UK law for you there. The police cannot even get near these sick people. It wasn't that long ago that those who claimed that there was a massive paedophile ring involving officials in the highest levels of government were written off as conspiracy theorists and kooks. That is no longer the case, at least in the UK. It turns out that this so-called conspiracy theory was true and is finally being officially investigated. A powerful elite of at least 20 prominent establishment figures formed a VIP paedophile ring that abused children for decades. Senior politicians, military figures, and even people linked to the royal family are among the alleged abusers. Peter McKelvey, 
the former child protection officer who first raised the alarm about high-profile individuals engaged in child sex abuse, said that their campaign of abuse may have been going on for as long as 65 years, but there has always been the block and the cover-up and the collusion to prevent an investigation. Over the years we've received many allegations of abuse at the highest levels of, of government, past Prime Ministers, past senior members of the British Cabinet have been mentioned as abusing children. It, it doesn't get much worse than that. We're talking about the worst kind of crime committed by the people who are supposed to be running the country. Palace officials have already been linked to the notorious brothel, the Elm Guest House in South West London. It was first in 2008 that news about deep roots of paedophilia inside Buckingham Palace emerged. Former Buckingham Palace butler was unmasked as a sexual predator who ran a paedophile ring while serving the royal family. Bachelor Paul Kidd, 55, was leading a secret double life as a serial child abuser who molested a string of boys over a 30-year period. Well, it seems that in Great Britain, protecting paedophile politicians is now turning to a matter of national security. Those with the sickest minds and who wish to act upon their destructive fantasies understand that they can most easily get away with their deeds if they are protected by an aura of power and ostensible respectability. The government will establish an independent inquiry panel of experts in the law and child protection to consider whether public bodies and other non-state institutions have taken seriously their duty of care to protect children from sexual abuse. But Victims of child sexual abuse have warned Theresa May they will withdraw considered. from the government's and controversial official inquiry unless major changes are made. In, total, the In an open letter, 24 signatories crimes. claimed the inquiry Please as it stands is not fit items. for purpose because of what it is being asked to examine and to the, the proposed chairs. The signatories said they had no option but to end engagement with the inquiry until Mrs May scrapped the current panel, replacing it on a transparent basis, declared a statutory inquiry and extended the cut-off date to 1945. They wrote to Home Secretary Theresa May's officials complaining, the Home Office seems to be running the inquiry to meet others' needs rather than those of survivors. We need three things. Justice and support for victims, the truth about what happened and how the Home Office and others responded, and stronger child protection and reforms for the future. Well, well, let me tell After the release of a report in into Home Office cover-ups last month, Mr Cameron seemed to dismiss survivors' concerns, saying some who have been uh, looking for conspiracy theories will have to look at the tip of the iceberg. Just a reminder. The royal family is granted absolute protection from public scrutiny in a controversial legal reform designed to draw a veil of secrecy over the affairs of the Queen, Prince Charles and Prince William. With the elite paedophile ring now being exposed in the UK, all roads are leading to the British royal family. Some claim this law was passed to keep this connection hidden, but as we now know, Prince Charles' favourite was Jimmy Savile who is the biggest paedophile and necrophiliac in modern British. And our top story, Buckingham Palace has issued a strongly worded denial that Prince Andrew was involved in any impropriety after he was named in American court documents related to a convicted paedophile. Well, the claims were made in a lawsuit connected to the conviction of US billionaire Jeffrey Epstein, a friend of the Prince. Right. right. Professor Dershowitz, you are in the same situation as Prince Andrew in that, in fact, the allegations, the charge being made here effectively is that you had sex with the Jane Doe 3, is, is how she's named in these papers, as did the allegations go Prince Andrew. And also it suggests here that you were witness to sexual abuse of other minors by Jeffrey Epstein. Mm -hmm. Now, can, can you give us some sense, though, of why you are tied into this? Did you, do you know Prince Andrew? I met Prince Andrew on a number of public occasions. He came to my class at Harvard Law School and spoke to the students. I met him 
at a birthday party by Lord uh, Evelyn Rothschild, um, but I've never been alone with Prince Andrew, I've never been at a party with any women with Prince Andrew, and I'm certainly not a witness or participant in any uh, sexual activities whatsoever. Have you met him with Jeffrey Epstein? I met him, Jeffrey Epstein, if I'm not mistaken, was at uh, Evelyn Rothschild's party. Um, I've never been alone with Jeffrey Epstein and with uh, Prince Andrew, no, never. But uh, you, you, you have represented Jeffrey Epstein in the past, haven't you? Because it's one thing you're effectively being put in the same situation as Prince Andrew, but you have been involved in this case. I mean, you said that... There's nothing new about paedophilia, but I believe the particular problems we face today have their roots in the 1960s and 70s. In amongst all the good things brought by the sexual revolution, a dangerous new group emerged they called themselves the Pedophile Information Exchange, or PI for short, and wanted sex with children to be legalized. They'd even had the gall to argue their case on Newsnight. A child is able to recognize a pleasurable experience. He is able to recognize um, a, a pleasing emotional experience. Um, he is able to express consent and to, to recognize that this is something he wishes to continue uh, and a responsible, um, caring pedophile. Um, it always refers to the um, wishes of the child. Pi enabled pedophiles to get organized. And it wasn't just information they exchanged. These men were paedophiles seeking other paedophiles. Pi published a magazine, Magpie, and later its members published another magazine called Minor Problems. Both of these magazines served as contact points for paedophiles. They served as a way for paedophiles to exchange child pornography and in some cases locate children to abuse. In what now seems like a moment of madness, Pi was actually taken seriously. They submitted evidence to a Home Office inquiry regarding the age of consent laws and were linked to the National Council for Civil Liberties at a time when Harriet Harman and Patricia Hewitt were senior members. If today an organisation had said, men should be free to have sex with children at whatever age and we're campaigning for this, they would be howled down. They would not be allowed anywhere near the corridors of power and influence. Pi was. Because of Pi's success, paedophiles helped each other to infiltrate our institutions and gain access to our children, especially in schools and residential care homes, making the problem even worse. So what did we do to try and stop it? And why didn't it work?